Okay, guys. So, welcome to the class. How are you doing? Good evening. How's things going with you? Good, good. 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 How are you? Very good. Very good. Um, well, we are almost a year, guys, that we are doing these uh, Zoom classes already. It's amazing. Uh, okay, so let me introduce myself, and then I. I start asking something about you, and then we start the class, okay? So I'm Professor A. Renkifo. I'm actually from economics. Um, what I teach is everything that is related to mathematics and finance. Financial econometrics is one of them. I, I, we do financial economics, financial analysis, and everything that is math related to finance. That's what, what I do. Uh, I do a lot of consulting in the city. Uh, I do stock pricing, trading portfolio, I do options, uh, quite a variety of fixed income, emerging markets, frontier markets. I, I do all, all this stuff that is related to finance. So it, it is really interesting to, to talk about finance. Now, uh, I have a PhD in, in, in economics and it's quantitative economics, what we call in normally econometrics. That's my, my PhD. Uh, uh, science is, is moving quite a lot, guys, and my time, the maximum we had was neural networks. I don't know if you have heard about that. I'm not, I'm not sure we, have, we can have some time to talk about them here. But uh, we have now artificial intelligence that was not in my time. We have deep learning models. We have a bunch of, uh, of in very interesting models that can help us model or forecast what we try to do. Okay, so this class is not going to go to that level. This class is going to be a kind of a, the, the, the foundations of financial economics, uh, sorry, uh, financial econometrics, okay? So I want to give you what you need to go into the industry and, 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 and feel safe of doing the things and say the correct things, okay? In my past experience, guys, I was also the, um, one of the members that interview for GP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. So I have a lot of experience interviewing a college grad like you uh, that are applying for this type of positions in the industry. Okay. Um, well, this is me. So I'm normally available. Uh, just send me an email now. I normally have office hours. Just send me an email now if you have some questions and we can start talking about that. Okay. Uh, you have my email in the syllabus, etc. So let's talk a little about the, the syllabus before, before we go a little introduction about you. So let me show, let me share my screen. Okay, so this is important. So this is a syllabus, guys, you should have this. Correct? You have the syllabus. Everyone has received the syllabus. If you're not, you need to tell me because you're not in my list then. Uh, yes, I have the syllabus. Okay, perfect. So guys, the class is from 5.30 to 7.20, so let's try to be sharp in time. So time is going to be of consideration in this class. We need to do a lot of things. You're gonna see in a minute. Now, as usual, guys, the, 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 usual, the, the useful background that hopefully it's gonna help us is math, statistics, econometrics, if you have some idea and finance, okay? Uh, in any case, the, the class is going to be very comprehensive. So I will do almost everything in class, right? So we have the book, uh, the book that is the, the benchmark book, where's my book here? Here, this Brooks, you know, any, any edition. You know, if you start from the third edition up, this is good. Uh, as I mentioned to you guys, this class is very, very, compact, so we need to do a lot of things, and that's why I, I'm using ebooks, okay? So I just asked today for university if, if they were able to, to provide us with ebooks for everyone. So they told me that they are going to do their best. So we are going to use ebooks in a couple of weeks. So I, I will continue pushing hard to get the ebooks for everyone. And the common question is why do I, I don't use MATLAB, R, Python, or other programs that we use normally in industry? Because if I do that, guys, I'm not going to finish even one fourth of what I need to teach. Okay, so eBuse is a program that is extremely simple. It's very, very straightforward to use, uh, and, and and we need to use it. Okay, so now what we have also in in, in the class, guys, is this is the grading. You know, 
we have class participations, basically just be in the class and try to participate, try to make questions, ask questions, uh, contribute with the class. There is a lot of things that you can contribute, I'm pretty sure about that. We are going to have four quizzes, okay, and we're going to, to drop the, the lowest one. And, and the quizzes are very quick, so 30 minutes, more or less, and, you know, just to show me that you are learning what we have been doing. And I will let you know at least a couple of weeks in advance before of, of any of the quizzes. And then we have a final exam, guys, that, is a, a, that believe me or not, is an oral exam. Okay, so what I do is I, why I do an oral exam? Because I want you to show me, I, I will have the opportunity to see how technically you work in, in the quizzes, how, how good you are progressing in the class participation. And in the, in the final exam, guys, what I want to use to do is really base your understanding. Do you understand what you're talking about? Do you understand what? The problems are how do you solve the problems everything's going to, it needs to be in your mind because you're going to talk with me the, um, the, the final exam is for us one to one okay makes sense okay the grading as usual guys you have that cross contents here so i have done a couple of uh, modifications to the model this year okay, we're going to talk about a little about uh, markov switching models and perhaps qqr quantile quantile regression we're going to talk about that it depends on how fast we go uh, do you have questions, guys? The, the main book is this one here, Brooks. And then the remaining ones are readings or... And to be uh, truthful with you guys, normally we don't have time to do a lot of reading. You need to run with me, okay? So that's why, guys, participation in class is crucial. Being in class is crucial for you. So I, I need you to be in class, All right? So if, if you cannot make it, okay, you, you need to let me know and then I can, I can organize something for you. But uh, this class is being here, okay? Makes sense to you, it's like a regular class, you need to be in front of me, you need to be taking notes, you need to be working with Excel, working with EDUs with me. And that's the only way we're gonna learn. Makes sense? Uh, the speed depends on you guys. Normally I, I, I set a speed at the very beginning and just to test how are you doing. And then if I see that you're responding, I, I continue moving faster. But if I see that you are, well, what I mean, I see, it's very tricky now because I really don't see. Uh, you need to tell me, you need to tell me, hey, Professor Hippo, please, can you slow down a little? I, I don't understand this point. I answer every single question. Try to do it in class, okay? Because it's fresh. So if you have questions, you need to understand what I'm doing and ask me questions. There is no dumb questions here in, in this class, guys. Okay? So now, the, the perspective of financial econometrics, guys, is not only applying the computer and, and running and analyzing results because that's not a core. What I want from you in this class is to give you a mathematical understanding of why the things are happening, how do we solve the issues, why the issues happen, how do we detect issues, got it? So it is very, you're gonna see that uh, it is very powerful. There is a lot of content here, but it requires time from you. You need to study, guys, got it? It is more or less like accounting. You know what, accounting is very easy if you track, if you follow up the classes. This class is exactly the same that we're going to be building up. So everything that we do in class number one is going to be used in class number 10, for example. And even though we change the model, even though we don't use the ordinary list squares, we use time series models, but you're gonna see that the logic is exactly the same. It's, it's a simple different model, but the, fun, the foundations is going to be crucial. For you. Now, uh, questions, guys. Professor? Yep. I see you put some readings uh, in your syllabus. Uh, yes. So are you are you gonna talk about the papers or no. what, what are those for? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's what I was telling to you. Uh, they are there for your reference, for your reading, but they're not going to be covered in class. We don't have time to do that. Okay. Okay, so they are good readings, uh, really interesting readings if you, go to, if you want to go into the financial markets. They are very interesting readings, but uh, two, you're gonna see that there is a lot of material. Okay, and I want to cover all the material. I want you to be ready and able to, to learn from all this material. Right? Okay. okay. Now, uh, the, the programming part, uh, you know, it is not related to this class. We have a programming class in the summer, guys. For those interested in programming related to econometrics, finance, and economics, you're more than welcome to join us in, in the summer. Okay, so then we just do programming. This class is more econometrics and trying to move as fast as, fast as, we, as we can. Make sense to everyone? Okay, questions? No questions? 
so what we can do now is then uh, what I would like to is just to know something about you guys, just a little about who you are. If you're doing a master's, a PhD, what is your experience in math, uh, statistics, and, and econometrics, and some finance, general terms, okay? So we can start, I have here the, the, the list. So Boyd, James. I, uh, I'm in an accelerated master's program, so I'm a senior year of undergrad right now. Yeah. And this is my second grad class. So I have like, I'm almost done with my economics undergrad and I haven't taken econometrics, but I've taken a uh, financial economics and stats one and two. And yeah. I'm currently taking uh, fi not finance, math for economists. Oh, math for economists. Okay, perfect, James. Thank you. Uh, we have Brown, Rashad. Brown, are you, are you there? Give me one second. Uh, good afternoon, class. Uh, as the professor said, my name is Rashad Brown. I am a first year grad student. Uh, this is my third econometrics course uh, between graduate school and uh, undergrad. Currently work for JP Morgan Wealth uh, Management and just looking to further my knowledge. Oh, great. So you're in the city, you're going to the city or not? Yeah, unfortunately, yes, I have to go to the city. <laughs> be careful. Yeah, be careful there. Thank I'm you. I'm trying my best to. Yeah, I don't know, I know, I know. Metro North is kind of crazy and the public transportation in the city is crazy. Thank you, Rasha. Uh, Bufan? Uh, hello. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm Fambu and... Fambu, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm a student of Master Data Science, and this is my second uh, semester uh, in Fordham University. And uh, this is my first uh, e uh, class related to economics. And uh, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So no econometrics in, in the past, no statistics, you do? Uh, in, under, uh, in undergraduate, uh, uh, st st I study some um, economics. Yeah. Okay, that, that's perfect. Just to know, I need to know where, where to start, guys. Sorry, uh, Rashad, when you say third, third econometric class, so you have taken some time series already? I um, know. Um, this was like 10 years ago. I honestly can't recall. So I would still, <laughs> no they treat me as if I am not knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Rashad. Fair enough. Uh, then we have uh, Caruso, John. Hi, Professor. Hey, John. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is John Caruso. Um, I am a second year master's uh, student in the data science program here at Fordham. Yeah. Um, I also got my undergraduate degree at Fordham as well at Rose Hill in 2016. Um, I was a chemistry major. Oh, interesting. But Yes, but uh, ever since I graduated, I actually uh, switched a bit, and now I work in finance. I work as an analyst for E-Trade. Okay. And, uh, yeah, in operations, and um, another way to uh, call to, uh, to categorize what I do is risk management. Mm -hmm. In that sense, um, and. Um, in the past, I, so far in my uh, course as a graduate student, I've taken data mining, advanced mm -hmm. financial programming, um, and um, I'm trying to think of the other courses I took so far. But, but that's, that's good. That's yeah, I just want to give you an idea. because Yeah, know, that's perfect. Cool. So have you, how have you feel that uh, E-Trade was involved also in all this mess with, uh, with trading? Oh, yes. No, I have lots of experience trading, um, you know, trying to determine, you know, just risk management in terms of that um, margin, margin requirements, all that oh, stuff. Beautiful, beautiful. Excellent. Thank you, John. Sure. Thank you. So we go, uh, Stefano Giacomo. Uh, hi, Professor. Hi, everyone. I'm Giacomo De Stefano. I'm a a senior undergraduate at Fordham University in the Accelerated Master's program. 
studying economics. So I've taken uh, statistics courses, uh, fi financial economics, cor well, math for economists courses, and uh, yeah, thank no, you. No, no econometrics, Giacomo. No econometrics yet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I, I forgot someone. Robert Creighton. Hi, everyone. I'm also, uh, I'm Robert Creighton, and I'm also in the Accelerated Master's program. So I'm a senior uh, undergraduate at Fordham. I've taken uh, Stats 1, Stats 2, and all of the core uh, economics classes, and I've also taken Math for Economists in the grad program. I've not taken any econometrics classes yet. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Daiwal Japmon. Not here. Uh, let me see. Oh, sorry, is that me? Uh, uh, where are you? Where are you? I don't see you. Uh, Jack, sorry. Uh, no, it is. Uh, Daiwal Japman. No, I don't think you, Jack. You're going to come soon. Okay, so we have a Guntur Deepak Kumar. Uh, hello, this is Deepak here uh, from India. Hey, Deepak, I've, I've done, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you doing, Professor? Good. So I've done my undergrad in uh, University of Central Florida in computer science. And mm -hmm. uh, in, towards my senior year, I started getting into like uh, finance, into like uh, trading markets as a retail trader. Mm -hmm. about, for about three years now, I've been working as a foreign exchange trader in, in the Forex market uh, mm -hmm. using retail platforms. And for about a year now, I've been getting into algo trading, algorithmic trading. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is my second semester in uh, the MS Data Science program in, uh, at Fordham University. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a few uh, statistics and math related oh, courses and a few machine learning courses in my undergrad. And I've done like advanced uh, financial programming last semester. So I'm hoping to like learn something about the markets Excellent. from this course as well. Yep, perfect, Deepak. Thank you. Li yeah. Shui. Uh, Hi, Professor. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shirley, and uh, you can also call me Shirley. And um, uh, I'm studying this science at Fordham University, and this is my final term. And my annual uh, undergraduate major is economics. I have learned some courses like advanced economic uh, econ econometrics and right. financial econometrics, but I think that I have forgot most of the knowledge. So I want to learn it again and uh, know more about the advanced the knowledge uh, related to financial. Perfect. And, uh, yeah. And I think that the time series model is uh, pretty important for a uh, forecast, uh, like the Arima model or Garch and uh, so on. So I registered for this class again and uh, uh, thank you for teaching us. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mu Yanchen. Uh, hi, Professor. Um, um, my name is Jia Chen Mu, and uh, uh, I study uh, uh, statistics and math in uh, undergrad, and I took uh, micro macro uh, econ class, but it was a very long time and. Uh, yeah, and uh, I just want to. I, I'm I'm data science major in Fordham University, Western, yep. and uh, mm -hmm. I just plan to get into the financial industry. So I just want to learn more about the basic financial econometrics, like some yep. knowledge of that. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Mustafa Ismail. Hi, Professor. Uh, hey, so Mustafa. I Hi, um, so I'm a senior at Fordham. Um, I'm getting my undergrad in accounting, but I'm also in an accelerated master's for data science program. Um, in terms of my background, uh, during my sophomore year of undergrad, so about two years ago, I took a micro and macro econ and as well as uh, advanced uh, statistical decision-making. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
honestly, that was like two, three years ago. So I kind of forgot all those things, but I'm excited, excited to learn under you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Smile. <clears throat> so we go now with uh, Mani Sandili. Oh yes, Sandili. I saw you. Sorry, Prof, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. How are you? Good in yourself? Very good. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm in the MA for economics program, and I have a little bit of um, knowledge in, in econometrics. Um, just a little bit, though. So that's why I took this class to learn more. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You, yeah, I took, uh, I had you for a long time already, mm -hmm. Sandy. Perfect. Welcome back. Uh, Natalie? Hi, I'm Natalie. I am in the Accelerated Master's Program for Economics. So I'm in my last semester um, in my undergrad. I'm double majoring in dance and economics. So two very weird, um, two very different uh, subjects, but I've taken, let's see, all the core uh, economics classes, but I've never taken an econometrics class, so. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I need to take some time because I need to take some notes also. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, we have uh, Rikena. Is she here? Is, uh, no, Rikena is not here. Okay, uh, Chu. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm a third year PhD student uh, in economics at Fordham. Uh, I got my math major, uh, uh, undergraduate, um, and uh, I got my master in economics at Duke. Uh, I pretty, uh, my research interest is uh, in uh, financial economics, um, but uh, I was, uh, I've been a math major all the time and uh, uh, have some uh, econo uh, economics um, those core economics classes before. So I haven't touched a systematic uh, financial econometrics course. Um, so this is the first official uh, complete a systematic one. Okay, good. But this is taken <laughs> Professor Bino's class, right? Econometrics. Yeah, uh, I know, like, uh, I heard of, like, uh, uh, touched a little bit of, of Garsh and uh, Arima with uh, okay. econometrics. Uh, two and also a set pricing before, mm -hmm. but uh, you know um, those graduate courses are for uh, students to uh, quickly uh, adopt to do research. Um, right, and uh, it's not like a, something that you can learn that and consolidate your knowledge. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So also another uh, goal of uh, uh, taking this course is to inspire myself and found if there's any there, there's any topic I can uh, do some research on. Oh, hello. Yeah. Hello. So now Chu, you need to remember that this class is gonna it's gonna develop from the very basics to more complex models. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for you perhaps what I can be doing is I can be providing you some readings and special topics for, for a PG, just giving you ideas of research. I have tons so you we can start developing this in this class. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. Mm. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Professor. Good evening. <laughs> um, um, so I was with you last semester as well, right. financial econ economics. Um, I, I have a degree in economics, so I've been exposed to statistics. A little bit of econometrics, so I'm familiar with ARMA and um, yeah, VA, a little bit of VAR and um, yeah, and math as well. But uh, Prof, I just wanted to request that because I saw you send notes to us before class, if you could kindly please send them a bit earlier because the, um, the time zone in South Africa is like seven hours ahead. Oh, you are in South Africa now? Wow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so definitely. Definitely. Yeah, so I will we, do that. Yeah, so when you sent them, shops were really close. I couldn't go print them out. Yeah. <laughs> no issue. Don't worry. I will, I will okay. do that. Yeah, I didn't know that there were people in South Africa. It's fun. Good, good. Good to know. Good, sir. Welcome back. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, so we have uh, Serrano, Stefania. Hi, um, my name is Stefania. I'm in the Masters of Data Science program, and I haven't taken an econ class or a finance class either. I've taken stats. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, Taylor, <clears throat> Termina Taylor. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Taylor. Um, I'm a first year master's in data science student. I did my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. So mm -hmm. in my undergrad, I took um, a few st statistics classes and I also took microeconomics and a few accounting classes. Um, I have no experience in econometrics, but I'm really interested in finance. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So we go. Uh, Thomas, Alexa Lenore. Hi, I'm Alexa. Um, I'm also a master's in econ student. I've taken a couple math and statistics classes and I've also taken an undergraduate econometrics course. Perfect. Do you remember something? Some econometrics? E yeah, I remember um, like the OLS model and a okay. little bit of time series. Great, perfect. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Wang Yichen. Hi, Professor. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is my second semester with Forham and a master in data science. And uh, I've had experience with econometrics before uh, when I was taking a corporate finance class in undergraduate yeah, but yeah that's a long time ago so i need to recall some <laughs> that's okay yeah thank you pleasure thank you uh shu Wanling. hello professor uh my name is Wanling. Uh, i'm currently doing a master degree in data science mm -hmm. um i have a i have a little bit of economic background back in undergrad like years back I probably don't recall anything at the moment, but uh, yeah, that pretty much uh, my background. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Shin, Susan. Hi, Professor. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Susan. I am a second year master in data science student. Um, this is actually my last semester at Fordham. Um, so for my undergrad, I actually um, was doing something a little bit different. I was in the food and nutritional program at Cornell, mm. um, but I also did, I took some classes. Um, I took statistics, I took a finance class, um, I took macroeconomics, but that was a while back. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really remember much about them. So this is um, my first finance in years and okay I don't yeah perfect <laughs> yeah okay so we go to Kevin yeah um, professor yeah sure um, my name is Kevin Alice it's my last year as a Fordham undergrad in the accelerated master's program I have taken econo uh, math economist on the graduate level and I also took a class with Professor Philip Shaw building dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model last semester. So I do have a bit of exposure to a statistic needed for um, economics. Yeah. I also currently work as a researcher at NASDAQ building financial indexes and, and um, just writing papers. Good, this is good. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. And then finally, we go to Lu. Hi, I'm Lu. This is my first year of master in data science program. And I have taken financial econometrics course on my undergraduate in UC San Diego. Oh, so you're UC San Diego? Yes. Nice. One of my co-authors is, is from there. Great. Thank you. Okay, guys, I think I have you all. It's kind of an interesting group. 
Okay, so let's let's see how do we do this. So everyone is with me, correct? So any questions about the, the syllabus, guys? No questions about the syllabus? No? So we can start? Okay, so let me, let me, let me share screen, white one. Guys, if, if we were in classes, I use a lot the Blackboard, a lot. So, and I, I do the same now here in, in, in Zoom. Uh, let me see, let me test first my, my tools now. Yes, I have it. Okay. So, I think guys that what we need to do is um, that the foundations of, of financial econometrics, the foundations are two, okay? One of them is obviously finance, okay? So that's why I have financial economics class that is guided towards that. I will do a summary in this class. And the other, the other foundation of econometrics, guys, is statistics, right? If we don't know statistics, we don't remember statistics, so we're going, we going to be basically in, in troubles. So, Let's, let's do a quick couple of classes with you on the statistics. So please follow me very quickly. So I, I will simply run. Uh, but I will provide you all the information you need to know for any, any econometric, econometrics class, not only finance. Okay? So let's do a, a brief review on, on the statistics. Otherwise, I will be talking a different language. So now, what is the statistics, guys? And, and what is crucial about the statistics is the following. So let's think about a couple of things. So imagine that we have something that we call a population. Okay, USA population, Fordham students population, graduate students population, etc. So what we do with the statistics is basically try to understand the population. Got it? Unfortunately, guys, population normally is very big, so it requires a lot of resources and time and money to just reach everyone. So what we do in the statistics is what? What we do is we create samples. Okay, and, and of course, guys, sampling is a complete class. Okay, and, but what I can tell you is that sample must be representative. So what, what is the meaning of representative? One easy example. Do you know that, the, uh, have you heard about the pyramid, the economic pyramid? So imagine this is my population. Okay, I have 1% that is extremely rich, etc. And then we have more than 50% that is below $40,000 per year. Make sense? So if this is my population, guys, and I want to create a, a representative sample, what I need to do is I need to try to recreate my population in terms of a small sample. Got it? So if I have 1% here in extreme rich, I should have 1% of my sample extreme rich. If I have the next 9% that are rich guys, so I need to have 9% of rich guys. So this is what I call representative. Got it? So if your sample guy is, guys is not representative, anything that we do next is completely crap. Do you understand that? Makes sense to you? So imagine, if, imagine that my question here is to, to study the average income in USA. Right? And imagine that you just, I, I ask you guys, let's do a sample of a thousand people. And imagine that you are at Forum and you say, oh, you know what? I will do something easy. I will just go in front of Forum to the Bronx. And what you are going to get is basically more people in this region, do you agree? So then if you try to do an average analysis on this one here, so you're terrible, because this is not going to be representative of US population. Make sense? So this is what we call representative uh, sampling. Now, when we do the sample, what do we do? So what is a normal, a normal regular class in a statistics guys? Okay, so I have my sample. What I need to do is something that it is called, so let me draw something like that. I need to do something that is called descriptive statistics. I need to understand the data.
Got it? And remember, guys, this is something that we must always do. I need to understand my data. I need to know what is the maximum, what is the minimum, what is the range, how is the mean, does it have a single mode, multi mode, etc. So this is what we need to do. And if you read the paper, guys, any, any economics or any science paper, the first thing that the people do when they present data is descriptive statistics, okay? Because it provides you a, a clear view of how the data is organized, how the data is, is presented to you. Okay, so in descriptive statistics, we have two, well, we have three, but let's do two first of all. We have central tendency. And of course, we have dispersion. Okay. And I will talk a little more about uh, some relationships also. Now, in central tendency, what, what do you remember, guys? What do we have? Mean, median, mode. Exactly. But let's call them sample mean. Okay, so let's do some notation already. The sample mean is going to be x bar. I will have the sample mean. We don't have notation for that. Sorry, the sample median. And I will have my sample mode, okay, in general. Okay, so basically what this measure central tendency tell you guys is the focal, how focalized the data is, got it? Now dispersion, of course, is something that go together with, with tendency. So here what we can talk, we can talk here about, um, for example, the mean absolute deviation, yeah, let's talk about, uh, well, of course, the range, the mean absolute deviation, of course, the variance. Okay, so let's do some notations here. Ah, sorry, we're talking sample variance, so this is not my notation. So everything is sample. Sample variance. My notation here, guys, is going to be S square. Then we have the, standard, the sample standard deviation that I call, that we're going to call S. Got it? And then we have all measures of association, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we, we will see soon. Got it? So, I can write here association. Of course, correlation is one of them. We use a lot in finance. Coefficient of determination. So this is the, the famous row, or call it R. And this one here is called R square. Pretty sure you have seen this before, so. Got it? So this is the first part we do in, in, in the statistics, guys. We need to understand and to describe the data. And it's exactly something that we do in, 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 in econometrics, okay? So I need to understand my data. I need to see if there is seasonality. I need to see if there is special weekends or if, this, if there is outliers, etc. So I need to understand first my data before going into econometrics, got it? And so that's what we need to understand in a couple of minutes. Okay, guys, the other component of, of a statistics is once you understand this part here, what you need to do, remember, guys, at the end of the day, what we try to do is we try to understand the population. Right? That, that's the idea. I, I want to understand the population. So what we are going to do here, guys, is something that is called inferential statistics. So what is inferential statistics? It's basically, if I have the, the sample mean, what can I say about the, the population mean? Okay, so in here, we also have the, we also have descriptive statistics, but here we have population parameters. Okay, and the population parameters guys are exactly the same as, the, as, as below. So we have central tendency. We have dispersion. 
But here in central tendency, for example, we call population mean, that we call mu, uh, the Greek mu. Here, for example, we have the population variance. And we are going to use sigma square. And then we have the population mode, the population median, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So remember, the idea that we have is I have my sample, I compute an statistic, and based on this statistic, what I want to do is I want to make educated guesses about the population mean. Okay? So if I have my, the mean of my sample, income mean in my sample is $100,000, how certain I am that my population mean is also $100,000? So that's what we're going to try to do with inferential statistics. Make sense? But now, in order to, to make inferential statistics, guys, we need something here that is extremely important. Remember that? What is missing in, in my statistic summary here? Probabilities. Okay? In order to make inferences from descriptive statistics to population parameters, I need to know probabilities. Right? So we are going to be using all the time in econometrics, guys, normal distribution, T distribution, F distribution, K squared distribution, gamma distribution, Poisson distribution. We're going to be using all these distributions. What are these all distributions are simple probabilities? Okay. Make sense to everyone? Okay, so what, what I will do during these first two classes, guys, is really to, I need to do that, otherwise you're, gonna, you're not going to follow up what I'm going to be doing. I will do a summary for you in two classes, two, two and a half classes, of everything that is required in, in econometrics about the statistics. Make sense? Questions? Professor, I have one question. Uh, by your pyramid, uh, could you spell out the term for me? I think I missed it. Uh, oh, see, yes, inferential statistics. Uh, I can write this. Make sense? Okay, so no questions. Do you understand what we're doing? Okay, so let's start with the easy part. What happens when you have data? Anything, any data. You, you have the stock prices of Amazon, for example. You have uh, three years of daily prices of Amazon. So data, guys, is simply, well, if, if it's daily, time series data, it's simply organized data from one to 500 data, that's all, we agree. But just per se data has, you know what, what I do with this data. Okay, first of all, what I'm trying to tell you is try to understand the data, just very basic statistics, got it? That's what we're going to try to do. Now, when we try to understand data, guys, we're going to basically use central tendency and dispersion, okay? I need to, to give you a couple of, of words about central tendency, because this is crucial. Okay, so the first one, the sample mean. Okay. 
So how do we compute the sample mean, guys? Well, let's write the sample mean. Let's write some notations here. The sum of i equal one to n of x i divided by n, correct? Do you understand this notation? We are going to be using this type of notation all the time. Guys, do you get this notation here? Uh, yes, I understand it, Professor. Okay, everyone? Yes, yes, we get, I get it. Perfect, okay. So this is my sample mean. Well, the sample mean is simply you sum the numbers and then you simply divide by the number of observations, correct? Done. Now, what happens with the sample mean? So let me open Excel. I think it's going to be much easier. Now what happens? Do you see my, my Excel? Yep. Yeah. So this is X, okay? So let's do very simple numbers. Mm -hmm. Two, five, eight, six, seven, eight, okay? So my, <clears throat> I will do the formula, okay? So what I will do is, everyone is familiar with Excel, right? So what I do, my mean is simply the sum of all these numbers divided by the number of observations. Count simply counts, is the number of observations, count these numbers. You agree? Of course, you can use the, the Excel formula average and then you, you get the, the average also. Okay, so don't, don't stress with the formulas here, just take a look to what happens. <clears throat> so what is this six, guys? It's basically where the, the, the numbers are more clustered together. That, that's the meaning of the mean. Now, what is the problem with the mean? Do we have a problem with the mean or not? Uh, it includes outliers as well. Exactly. The, the problem with the, the mean, guys, and, and this is something you must know because we use means, conditional means all the time. We can have issues with outliers. Okay, so the issue with this guy here careful that outliers can destroy all your estimation. Got it? So if we talk about financial analysis, guys, for example, what has happened to AMC is catastrophic, you see that? So if you use this data set and you try to do some analysis with that, then you're going to be destroyed. So your analysis is going to be simply crap. Make sense to you? Okay. If we, if we use uh, the flash crash of May 2010 also, your, your results are going to be crashed, are going to be useless, okay? And, on, and why? So take a look to what happens with a single number. So you see here, my average is, is six, correct? Now let's assume that I have only a single number. So let's assume that this number is 25 now. Or let's oh. assume that this number is feet. Oh, you see my Excel? Yeah, no, we can see your Excel. Yeah, no. Oh, sorry, I need to go back to Excel then. Take a look, guys. So this was eight, I think, before. Yeah, you see? Now, what happens if I, I simply exaggerate and, then, and I have a single number, a single number, 50? You see that? What is the mean of my, of my sample? 13. Take a look, guys. The only, where is 13 here? You, you know, the mean is supposed to be a kind of a, where the data is more clustered. Do you see 13 or, or, or these numbers are close to 13? No. Okay. Because a single number destroyed my mean. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. When we do analysis guys in econometrics, we always use conditional means. And so we need to be extremely careful and extremely aware of the outlier product. Make sense to everyone? Next sense to everyone. So I will show you techniques to, to, to handle outliers, but do you understand that? Okay. Now, of course, the, 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 the sample median is simply that you simply sort the data 
and you just take the middle observation, correct? They agree with me, guys? Sort data and middle observation. That's the median, correct? So if you take a look to the median, so let's do the median in, in Excel. So what I need to do is, okay, let me, okay, let me move this, to, yeah, let me put that, whatever. So let me move this, I will copy this somewhere here. What I need to do is I need to sort the data. Uh, I will sort uh, smallest to largest, that's perfect. And so what is my middle value? Two here, two here. So it's going to be the average of these two guys, correct? My medium is going to be simply 6.5. Make sense to you guys? Make sense to you? So now, what happens if, if this number is whatever, 150? What happened with my media? It doesn't change. Okay, so that's the beauty about the median. The median is free of outlier problems. However, guys, mathematically working with a median, it is a pain. <laughs> Got it? So the medium has no outlier, no outlier problems. But as I will show you later, guys, working with the means in econometrics is, is, is harder, okay? It is possible because there are models already that work with the median, but at the, at the beginner's level, fundament, foundation's level, it is, it is trickier, right? Now, of course, we have the sample mode. What is a mode, guys? The most common element. Yes, it is the element that repeats the most. Do you agree? In my example, I am not sure if I have a, a median. Uh, sorry, a mode. No, I don't have a mode. Do you see that? There is no number that repeats more than one. When you don't have a mode, guys, what do you have? How do you write no mode? If you have no mode, how do you write that? No mode equals zero? Would it just be uh, empty brackets? Exactly, guys. Or this one here. Empty. Okay, so many people confuse that. When you say, if I ask you guys, what is the mode of your sample? Zero. Okay, immediately what I believe is that zero is a number that's repeating the most. Got it? If you don't have a mode, meaning that there is no number that repeats more than once, it's empty. Okay, please. Pay attention to that because I remember my first years of working with R, I, I invested almost one month on, on understanding why the mode was not working. And remember, R guys is an open source program and happens to be that there were, you know, three or four ways of computing the mode and I selected randomly one. And this randomly one was assuming that when there is no mode, the, the, the program was reporting zero. So it messes up everything. And I, it took me one month to understand why, what was going on. It was a loss of time. Make sense to you? Okay. So now we can go into um, into perhaps a little dispersion. Okay. So in dispersion, I told you guys that we have, what is dispersion guys? So dispersion is basically, if, let me see. It is basically the following. So this is the, if you have data located around here, no, this is less dispersed of data that can have the same mean mode, but you know what the potential values are, are more to the left or to the right. Got it? So this is dispersion. Now, why this dispersion is crucial in terms of not only of statistics, but in terms of, of finance, guys, is that remember, in finance, we always use two concepts. We have returns and risk. Make sense to you? Now, more dispersion implies what? 
more risk. Make sense? So in, in finance, guys, dispersion is simply risk. Now, how do we measure dispersion? Of course, we have a lot of discussion, a lot of models. We have catch models, we have simple standard deviations, and we have a tons of other models that we're going to study later. Right? But dispersion is simply how separated the data is from a common middle point, that normally is the middle. Got it? So how do we measure distance? So imagine that this is my, my mean, this is my middle point, mean or median. How do I measure distance? There are two ways of measuring distance, guys, remember? One is absolute value, because remember, distances cannot be negative. So one is simply xi, let's assume minus the mean. Agree with me? So this is one measure of distance. And if you divide this, because you want to know that the average distance, this is what is called the mean absolute deviation. Now, what is your way of measuring distances, guys? How do you make a number that, is, that can be potentially negative into a positive number? What do you do? You could square it. Exactly. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot here the sum. It should be sum here. Of course, what you do is simply take the difference, square it, and divide it by, I will explain you why. This is what I call the sample variance. Now, guys, please pay attention. I will explain you more about this stuff in the future, OK? When you talk about the sample variance, you divide by n minus 1. Not by n, by n minus 1. OK, so this is related to unbiasedness. Okay, I will explain you that in the future, but just remember when you have the sample variance is um, you divide by n minus one. And of course, this is my sample variance. What is the issue with the, with the sample variance or variance in general, guys? What are the units of the sample variance? If we're talking about uh, prices, for example, what are the units? Dollars, if we're talking about dollars, what, is the, what are the units of the, of the sample variance? Guys, someone. Dollars a square. You agree? Because we are squaring the number. So it's going to be dollars a square. Now, in finance, we don't use dollars a square. We use dollars. So that's why instead of this guy, what we, what we use is S, that is a positive side of the square root of s square and how do we call this we call it sample a standard deviation Make sense to you? Okay, now, issues with distance metrics. Oh, well, of course, the, the range, guys, I, I always forget the range. What is the range? Basically, the max minus the mean, you agree? So basically, it takes this one to this one. Now, questions about outliers. Are these metrics influenced by outliers? Remember, we are using here the mean, do you agree? And the mean is subject to outliers. So if the mean is part of the formula, the mean absolute deviation, the variance and the standard deviation, all of them, including the range guys, suffer the issue of outliers. So that's why, guys, 
before doing any econometric model, we need to be sure that we don't have outliers because we know that outliers are going to destroy our estimates, not only about the conditional mean, but also about the conditional variance. So all our results are going to be simply crap if we don't really take care of them. <clears throat> Professor, just one quick question. Um, yeah. Ollie's are very clearly explained just one thing you said before though, you said dispersion it's more risk since dispersion implies return and what again? No, 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 <clears throat> no. Dispersion, you know, in general, dispersion is simply how dispersed the data is respect to a common right. point. Right. Okay. In finance, <clears throat> remember, imagine these are returns. Okay. So this is minus 1% to 1% versus minus 10% to 10%. Make sense? So in finance, dispersion, we also interpret this one as risk. Because right. remember, in the second one, the probability of making 10%, you have also the probability of making minus 10%. So your risk in this game is higher than the risk in minus one and one percent. Right, I get that. It, which is, sorry, I, I misused my word here. I mean, there's a more dispersion is more risk. More no, risk. I, yeah, yes. I was actually asking, you said dispersion implies return and what again? Like you said, another word, I didn't really, I couldn't hear you. Uh, dispersion implies returns. What do you mean? Like the data and dispersion implies return, and you also said something else. Oopsie, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, okay, not good. <laughs> I don't remember. Anyone? Anyone remembers what I have told? No. Well, you know, perhaps in return. Sorry. Was it just the uh, that dispersion implies the risk and return? Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. I was saying that in finance, guys, and, and this is true in, in everything we do, okay? In finance, we have uh, expected values, means, okay? And then we have <coughs> risk. That is basically dispersion. Okay? So that's why in every single model we have uh, that we're going to be dealing, guys, always we're going to be talking about what is my expected value, but at the same time, what is expected, uh, what is going to be my expected risk. Uh, so dispersion is, is linked to risk and means, conditional means is going to be related to expected values. But we're going to see this in a few. Make sense to everyone? Questions? <clears throat> No questions? Okay, so there is something that is called symmetry. Okay, I, I will draw any distribution, guys, okay? I, I will do one example later. A symmetric distribution, guys, is one that looks like, I'm pretty sure you have seen the normal distribution. Okay, 50% here, 50% here. However, we don't, don't necessarily have symmetry. So we have sometimes, have something like that, or in general, we can have something like that, got it? So my mode, so in this case, my mode is in the same position as my mean, as it's in the same position as my median. In this case here, guys, the mode is always the, the peak. So this is my mode. Normally my mean is going to be here. And in between is going to be my median. This one here is called negatively skewed. Here, my mode, perhaps my median, and my mean is going to be here. And you understand why. Now, the mean always follows the, the outlier. So in this case, I have an outlier to the right. In this case, I have an outlier to the left. So that's why this guy is called positively skewed.
And in finance, guys, what we see the most is negatively skewed, negative skewedness. And why is that? Why in the market we observe larger negative returns than larger positive returns? Why is that? Do you have an idea, an intuition of that? An intuition on that. Uh, professor, could you repeat the question again? Yeah, my question is the following. This is normally what we observe in, in, in the market, financial markets. In financial markets, we don't see this sym symmetric distribution. Normally, we have this distribution. What is the meaning of, of this distribution, guys? That negative values, for example, these ones here in the left, are, have a, a, highly, a high probability than similar values in the right. So for example, a minus 10 is more likely than having, so this, this should go down, down, down very quickly. So if you continue this one here, okay, so let me do a red one. So assume, uh, let, me, let me do it here. So assume this is a 10% positive and assume that here is my 10% negative. Okay, so what is the meaning of this graph here, guys? Remember that kind of the, the height tells you the probability, correct? So here, basically, the probability of having a 10% positive is very small. The probability of having a minus 10% is higher. And this is what we observe in the, in the market, guys. So why the probabilities of having a negative return are higher than, have, than having the same magnitude of a positive return? Why? Do you have an idea? No? Uh, professor, um, I'll offer a few, I'll offer a few, um, uh, you know, real life possibilities. Yes, go ahead. Um, on an annualized basis, we yeah. like it, could just have, a, to put it simply, a bad year, right? Yeah. Um, that's if you know let's say you're perhaps a buy and hold investor mm -hmm. maybe if your goal let's say your goal is to hold a stock like you just buy the s p and you hold it for five mm -hmm. ten years mm -hmm. right then let's say for instance you bought the s p back in february of last year right and then you let's say you sold it and instead over in the March. summer just you sold it on yes april march yeah yeah, yeah you would have uh, lost a lot of money uh -huh. that's just a simple example so on an annualized basis yeah you wait, could wait wait but this could be your example however sure. if you kept your money up to now you should have yeah. you should have recovered right yes and then now, some, right. yes now comes a question and then you're going in the right direction why the people close positions on, on march april why do they close them on margin yeah. Well, no, close their positions. So if you're a, a buy and hold, mm -hmm. you know, March last year, guys, just remember when the, all the pandemic started, the market crashed, really crashed. And, and of course, many people closed their positions. Okay. Most of them, non-professional investors. Okay. They closed their positions. Why? Uh, fear, uncertainty, and margin. Exactly. Yes. So in, in economics, guys, this is something that we're going to be seeing. Okay. One of them, fear, what we call risk aversion. Okay, we're going to talk a little more about that. But in, in, in general, guys, and this is something that you can feel yourself. If you make money, if you make 10%, you feel happy, do you agree? And if you make, if you lose minus 10%, you feel very unhappy. If you kind of weight your happiness of 10% versus your unhappiness of minus 10%, the unhappiness is higher in value than the happiness in the in the ten percent, so you feel bad, okay? really bad, okay, and and that's what what humans react. So normally, what happens is that if the market is going down, you start feeling bad. Continues going down, you feel really bad. What do you do? If you are long, you exit the position. 
when you sell your position, what, what you're doing, you are contributing with the supply of the stocks. What happens when you supply stocks? The prices continue going down. Do you see? So this is also related, guys, and we, this is something really cool that we're going to understand. It's related to herding behavior. Okay, the herding behavior, guys, can go up and down, but normally herding behavior is stronger when the market's going down. Okay, so remember, guys, the markets are normally not negatively skewed because humans react more to negative news than to positive news. Okay, and, and, and that's a proven fact. You know, psychologically, we, I, I've done a couple of papers on emotions versus rationality, uh, herding behaviors, etc. And it, it was like that. So now, from here, from this part of the class, guys, remember that it's very strange that we have a symmetric distribution. We're normally going to have a negatively skewed distribution. Right. And this is going to give us a lot of insights later. Uh, questions? No? No questions, guys? Okay, so let's go to talk a little about measures of association. Guys, I assume that everything that I'm, I'm talking up to now is simply a refresh of your memory, right? You have seen this in the past, for sure. Somewhere in, you know, in the past, recent past or long, long time ago past, but you have seen this, this topic. It's just a matter of just remembering. And I need to do this because I will be talking about these terms all the time, okay? So in, in association, guys, we have two measures, okay? So let's do the correlation. Okay, so what is that the measure of correlation, guys? I will call it, well, I will call it R. What is the measure of correlation? Remember that? What, what do you measure by, by the correlation coefficient? Um, is it a measure of how strongly a change in one variable affects another? Right. Now, I will use uh, something that you need to remember always, okay? It is a measure of linear dependence, okay? And what I will call, so let's call this R there. So, sorry guys, let's call this uh, as, as R, sorry, as rho. Okay, so what we were going to call is rho of X and Y. So what is the linear dependence of X and Y? Okay, what is this linear dependence? Now, do you remember what are the, the limits of the linear correlation? Or the correlation, sorry, not linear correlation, the correlation. This goes between what and what? Negative one and one. Exactly. Okay, so the, the measure of correlation, guys, has then two components. One is the direction, because it has a sign. So negative correlation implies that if one goes up, the other one goes down, correct? This is negative correlation. And positive correlation implies that if one goes up, the other one also goes up. And what is interesting, guys, about this measure of correlation, also this provides you a magnitude effect. Okay, the closer to one or the closer to minus one, the stronger the effect. If rho equals zero, it is no linear dependence. Make sense? Guys, I'm, I'm stressing, you're going to understand this later. It is only linear dependence. We're not talking about other types of dependencies. We're going to use copulas for a non-linear dependencies, okay? Now, let's do one example. Imagine that a correlation of x, y equals 0 0.7. Uh, let's imagine that the correlation of x and y equals minus 0 0.3. So what happens if x increases in 10%? So what happens with y? Remember, you need to first tell me what is the direction and then the magnitude, the expected magnitude. What happens with y? Goes up or goes down? Would it go up? 
up because I have a positive number here. So this is going to go up. Okay, this is a, the first part of the of an, uh, analyzing the correlation. Now, by how much is going to go up? Of course, this is expectation. By how much is going to go up if X goes 10%, how much Y is going to go up? About Would 70%. it be 70% of yes, what Y 70%, went up? Yes, 70%, exactly. 70% of 10%. Basically, seven percent. Make sense? Of course, guys. Remember, these are expectations. Okay, I, I don't expect really to be seven percent. Can be a little more, little less. We're going to, to discuss this later in the future. This is econometrics. At this point, basics. So now, what happens if X goes up in ten percent here? So what happens with Y? It goes down 3%. Down because I have a negative sign here. So direction is down. And it's going to go, the magnitude is going to be 30% of 10%, uh, Make sense to everyone? Okay. So the, the second measure, the, the third measure, guys, not the second. It is uh, the coefficient, the R square. That is simply, guys, this number, the correlation is square. So R square is going to be between which values? Zero and one. Completely right. Zero and one. Got it? So in this case, we have lost the direction. We only have magnitude. You agree? So this is the famous R square guys that we're going to be seeing in, in econometrics. All reports we have an R square. What we want obviously guys is an R square that is close to one, correct? Because this implies a strong relationship. Okay, in econometrics, if you remember econometrics guys, R square closer to one is what you're looking for. Now, let me give you a, Kind of bad news just from the starting guys in finance if we get a strong r square we're talking about 25 30 percent perhaps okay there are so many variables in the market guys that having a, a very strong r square of 0 0.9 0 0.8 0 0.7 that sometimes we find in, in economics is going to be almost impossible as, as we are going to see using data Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, two quick questions. Yep. So, uh, for example, if we talk about the armor uh, in the future, uh, usually what uh, magnitude of R square can be considered as significant? You know, I, I have created models with 4%, 5%. What is crucial, true, what I'm saying is that what, what in time series matters the most is forecasting. Uh -huh. right? I can have an R square that's very low, but I can add the forecasting. I can modify the one in such a way that my forecasts are going to be better. You're going to see that, okay? okay. Don't, don't stress. Sometimes the students are, going, are collapsing when they say 5% or 10%. They say, oh, terrible model. Yeah, indeed. You know, in terms of R square, it's terrible. But uh -huh. it's not the only metric. Okay, in uh -huh. finance, we use a different metric. We use more metrics, more related to forecasting. I, I will show you that in, in time, too. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, you see, I, lo I see a lot of like a micro econometrics uh, papers. Uh, yeah. The R square, if the R square is like 4%, 5%, the, yeah. they still accept the, the result. Yeah. Of yeah. course, yeah. of course, that's the way it works. You know, so yeah. that's why I'm saying, don't, don't get frustrated with having R square that this is more. Uh, I will show you more models and more, more ways of trying to clean the R square. Sometimes you, you make a, a, a mistake, for example, you forgot outliers. 
or you forgot seasonality, and your R-square can be terrible. And just uh -huh. by adjusting seasonality and, and perhaps outliers, your R-square can jump significantly, okay? So uh, if, if after correcting everything, you still have the R-square that is small, okay, then we need to go into forecasting, out of sample forecasting, etc. We're gonna be using that. Uh -huh. uh, one quick question is uh, recently I uh, read a paper uh, by a, a PhD student uh, mm -hmm. at Chicago, University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, he did some machine learning um, algorithm to, to do some predictability. Mm -hmm. uh, the R square, some R square in his paper is negative. Uh, yeah. that's, that's confusing for me. Yeah, well, indeed the R square negative means that simply that the sample mean is the best, exp the, the best forecast for the, for the data. That's what an R square negative means. Now. However, if he's using artificial intelligence or machine learning, the R square is meaningless. Uh -huh. okay? Because you have so million, so many R squares that you know which one select. And uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, when you do artificial intelligence, you don't know which one is the, the final model at the end. So you see the results, but it's very tricky to go from the results or the forecasting. It's very tricky to know which is the model that best pro provides you the forecasting. It's, it's very tricky. So the R square is useless in that case. Now, in econometrics, having a, an R square that is negative, guys, simply means that the sample mean is the best forecast for your data. That's all. I, I will, I will, we want to see the details on, on Okay. That. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure, Hugh. So, and now, of course, guys, the other measure of, of and, and this is the basics of a statistic of econometrics, the scatter diagram. Do you remember the scatter diagram? Okay, let's do a couple of things here. Of course, I have my X and I have my Y. How do we call the X? Normally we call it exogenous. How do we call exogenous or independent? And normally Y is called endogenous or dependent. Okay. And what we we'll try to do guys is if, if I do simply my plot between two variables and, I, and I, I, I see something like that, what I try to do is I try to fit a line, correct? This is the first part of the class. I try to fit a line like that. And remember, this line has several components. It's going to be A plus B X, correct? How do we call A? So if I move this line to this point here, this is A. So A is, is called what? The Y intercept. The Y intercept. And how do we call B? The slope? Simply the slope. Okay. So this is going to be the foundation of, of the OLS model, guys, that we're going to be seeing. Of course, guys, the larger B, the stronger or the weaker the relationship in absolute value. The larger B, guys, implies that the slope is, is steeper and steeper and steeper, correct? So the larger B, the stronger the relationship between X and Y. Okay, now I, I, I just write here, relationship also called correlation versus causality. Okay, so here is a huge discussion, guys. Having an X and a Y, in this way, doesn't mean that X explains Y, unless you have a theoretical background for that. Okay, what can happen also is that Y explains X. If you put this Y in, in the X bar, X, Y can be explained in X. Got it? So please be careful. When we talk about relationships and correlation, we are not necessarily talking about causality. Right. One typical example is the following. So imagine X is uh, a advertising. And Y 
are my sales. Okay? The higher advertising, the higher the sales, you agree? So that's a positive. Normally what we believe is that advertising causes sales. That's why the people invest a lot of money in advertising just to improve their sales. Make sense to you? But now, <laughs> indeed, if you revert this one here, sometimes we can say that the more the sales, the more you advertise. So which one causes which? That's a different question. That's a different question. Do you agree? The technique is going to be exactly the same. However, can you be sure that advertising causes sales or are sales that causes advertising? Okay. When I was, uh, I, I was a given point in my life, guys, I, I managed a Continental Airlines, and now it's disappeared, now it's United, and managed all the business from Continental from Mexico down all Latin America. And I was fighting all the time with advertising guys, with, with uh, promotion guys. These guys wanted to do a lot of promotions because they believed they were doing sales. And I would say, no, 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 wait a second. Show me that you can increase advertising, you can increase my sales. And then we created this baseline sales, etc. But and then I show to them that not necessarily true that advertising improves sales, okay? It depends. For example, if you are in a week, 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 week period of time and flights, okay, in that case, it makes sense. But you're not going to be doing advertising in, in peak times, okay? And I, I show that. It depends in industry, but, but you need to be careful. Please, in your mind, relationship is versus co and correlation, that is the same. It is not necessarily equal to causality. Makes sense to everyone? Okay, so what you need to be very careful, guys, are these small tips that are, I'm just giving to you. So in econometrics, we're going to talk about causality relationships. We're going to talk about correlation. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, um, asymmetric distributions. We're going to talk about outliers, how an outlier affects the mean, the standard deviation. So basically how the outliers can affect your expected returns and how the outliers are going to, expect, uh, are going to affect your risk measure. Make sense to everyone? So you just need to be careful with all this stuff. Questions? Questions, guys? No? Okay, of course, we have also quantiles, etc. You have the box plot, etc. But I think that at this point, with this part here in descriptive statistics, I'm happy if you understand all this part. If you refresh your memory and you understand how to do this. Okay? Now, let's go into probabilities. Okay, so let's go into probabilities. Okay, so for probabilities, guys, let me, let me give you, let's do something easy. Okay, so assume that you have the following data. So you have your xi equals a grades financial econometrics. Okay, so assume that we interviewed 10 individuals. So, and I have 87, 89, 75. I'm just creating numbers, guys. Uh, Ninety-four, ninety-seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, ten observations. Do you understand? So these are the grades from one to so from zero to hundred. Ten individuals. Okay, and one way of of understanding this data, guys, is what we can do is we can create something that are called frequency distributions. Okay, well, for frequency distributions, guys, what we need to do first 
is to create the classes. Okay, so what I can say, for example, is uh, let's do let's do three classes. Okay, from and perhaps we can do from eighty-five to ninety. From ninety to ninety-five, and from ninety-five to a hundred. Okay, so this. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense to you. So these ones here, guys, are cl are called classes. Okay, class limits. Of course, as usual, guys, parentheses, 85 is not included here. Brackets, 90 is included here. Now, the classes, guys, satisfy the following properties. They are exhaustive. So what is exhaustive? It means that all the observations that you have must be in one of these, one of these classes and must be mutually ex exclusive. Okay. Then to build our table, guys, we simply talk about the frequency. We have something that is called the relative frequency. We have the cumulative frequency. And then we have the relative cumulative frequency. Make sense? So how do we build this table? And you're gonna see how, how important, why, why this table is important. Okay, take a look guys. What we do in the frequencies, we simply count the number of observations that fall in each of these classes. All right, so from 85 to 90, how many observations? I have one, two, three, three observations, correct? How many between 90 and 95, not including 90? Uh, oh, sorry. You know what, let me change these ones here because I have 85. So let, let me change these numbers here just to make my example easier. And I'm not to modify this a lot. Ah, I need to delete this for a minute. My fault guys, sorry. So let's start at 80 to 85. 85 to 90, 90 to 95, 95 to 100. Okay, so now it works. So this is 81. No, yes, this is 81. This is 80, 84. So I have two observations here, do you agree? I have three observations in the range 85 to 90. One, two. Oh, no. Oh, one, two, three. Yes. And then, in, uh, sorry, I have one, two, three. Also, I have three here. Okay. This is check. 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 What? Okay, 80 to 85, I have one, two, three, four. Now, 
Guys, are you with me? You know what I'm doing? <laughs> counting and not counting, I'm tired already. Okay, so between 1995, I have two observations, and then I have one observation in here. Correct? The trick that the sum of these numbers should be equal to one, in this case, 10. So this should be equal to my sample size, n. If you don't have 10 here, you're not being exhaustive. You're not being, you're not including all the observations that you have here. So you need to be very careful when n is 10, sorry, the, the number of, of, if you sum the frequency, this should be equal to 10, right, to the number of observations in your sample. Now, how do we compute the relative frequency? It's very simple. You simply divide four by the total number. So it's four divided by, by 10. So it's going to be 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. When you sum this one here, what do you obtain? Always one or 100%, always. Correct? Now, what is the cumulative frequency? Well, what you start, you simply start accumulating the frequencies. Four, the first one is four. The second one is going to be four plus three, seven. The next one is going to be seven plus two is nine. And the last one, nine plus one is 10. Another, another trick, this number here, the last one should be equal to the number of observations. And how do you compute the relative cumulative frequencies? Again, you, you start now summing the relative frequencies, 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, and one. And then guys, once you have your table, of course, this table is very small, very simple. You're gonna start asking questions like the following. Can you tell me the number of students that have grades between 80 and 90, not including 80 and including 90? Someone can give me this number. Is it seven? Between 80 and 90. So basically what I'm doing is these two, and what I do is these two, or this number here. Correct, everyone understand that? So how many, from my sample, how many students uh, have a grade between 80 and 90? Well, seven. Now, when we talk about number is always frequency and cumulative frequencies. When we talk about percentages, it's always relative frequencies or relative cumulative frequencies, all right? So now, what is the percentage of the students with grades between 90 and 95? Someone. Uh, is it 20%? 20%? Between 90 and 95, 20%. Etc. So you can have tons of, of, of questions like that. Questions, guys? Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, it says it's exhaustive. What do, what do you mean by exhaustive? It, sorry, oh, 
Yes, exhaustive means that all the observations here, so how many observations do I have here? 10, right? So all of these observations must be in one of these classes. So that's oh, why this- Got it, yeah. Got it? Okay. Now, what is mutually exclusive, guys? It means the following, for example, if I do this, this is wrong, do you agree? If I do bracket 90 here and bracket 90 here, basically means that 90 is here and 90 is here. So they are not, ex they are not exclusive. So that's, you cannot have this situation. Okay, guys, questions. I need more time for what is next. Uh, questions, guys, it's clear. Perfect. Okay, so we are going to stop here for this class. Just review what we are doing. Just try to refresh your memory and statistics. So, so hopefully next class we're going to be over with statistics. So next class, plus a little more of the, of, the, of the other one, because now we have this one here, guys, is the basics for, for, for probabilities. You're going to see how easy probability is going to fall in your mind. Okay, questions? No questions? So we stop here and, and we see you next class, guys. Please. Don't buy EVUs yet. I'm trying to get these EVUs from, from Fordham University. Hopefully, we can, we can get them for you. Uh, Professor, can I speak with you quickly after class? Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys. So, all of you are free to go. we we'll see you in, in a week. Okay? Uh, if you don't have questions, I, I just stay with someone that wants to, to speak with me. Pro professor, I have a quick question for yeah, you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Are you going to, I noticed you were recording the class. Are you going to post the recordings? You know, I have my issues with Fordham. Let me ask Fordham again, because Fordham last year told us that we cannot give you the, unless you're not in class. But let me, let me talk with them again. Okay. Okay. And the reason was the following, guys, is that during the, exactly one year ago, we started distributing the classes and the, the students in us were 20, appear one or two during the class. And there were many people who were not in class. And this was a mess because after that, you know, the students panic when we were very close to the exam. And so everyone was collapsing, asking questions on, on some things that were already uh, taught in class. So the idea here, guys, is be here, okay? Be here, be in the class, right? If you cannot do that, for sure. In, in that case, Fordham authorizes me to give you the, the recording from the cloud that is managed by Fordham, okay? But I will, I will talk with them. I will talk with them because this is a very intense class. So I, I think it deserves to have a, you, you deserve to, to have the classes with you and then you review these and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Allow me for a week for us asking for that, okay? Okay, guys. Perfect. So guys, see you next week. I just stayed with someone that wants to talk with me. Um, take care guys and, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Professor. I have a question Thank as well, you. but I'll wait to after uh, Kevin finishes. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, I mean, Russia, you can go ahead and ask if you guys want, because it's just, I have more of a private matter on that. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Understood. Um, I'll make this quick. Uh, professor, uh, during the first class uh, just now, I went on ahead and just purchased EVs. Uh, is there going to be any difference from what I've no, purchased? No, 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 no. I think Fordham is going to provide only a student version, but no, that's okay. This is your copy. Fordham provides okay. normally a six month program. That's it. That's good. Got okay. it. Thank you. Okay. See you later. Sorry, Professor. Yes, I have Sandile. a question on my side. Yeah. yeah. So I downloaded the student version of eViews. Um, yeah. So they give you like a mini license, but the only problem is you cannot save. Um, I, I'm not sure if you, I think you cannot save items or um, while you're working with eViews. So you have to kind of import stuff all the time mm, or start a work file from scratch. Yeah, so yeah. I wanted to find the um, yeah, let, let me see How? that because don't don't stress with that, Sandili, because I'm really pushing really hard with four. I'm telling them, guys, come on. It's not really mm -hmm. expensive software that we can use. Don't don't stress. Mm -hmm. Let me give me one week to, to try to solve that. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Because then my it ties into my next question. Are you gonna yeah. send us data sets that we're gonna use or yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um yep. mm -hmm. we'll do that. yeah, because if that's the case, I think we should be able to import the, the data yeah, sets. We, we need to. We, um, we the must. work files. We must. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, Thank you, you Professor. Take care. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Yeshen Chu, do you have questions? Do you have questions? I think they just probably. Oh, they just probably. Yeah. Did. Yeah. Okay. Kevin, tell me. Yeah. So um, here's my deal. Um, did you get an email from the Office of Disability about me? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Yes, yeah, I, no. I, I know that. So you're going to have more time. And normally what we are going to do with you is we start, say, if we start class at 5.30, we can start with you at 3.30, something like that. Yeah, yeah, no. Don't so stress I'm, with that. Yeah, I'm yeah. supposed to get 2x. I mean, like, realistically. Two times, I, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, realistically, am I going to need it? Don't yeah. know. But, you know, it's just well, nothing good to have. Don't and worry. then second yeah. thing, um, this is a, I guess this is kind of a relevant question. Like, because um, I, I kind of have, kind of a hard concept to grasp like how we're gonna practice between like classes if we're just not gonna code because like I all my coding classes ever taken is taught by Philip Shaw. <laughs> so like what's that meant is like you code. Like right. I, I just want to no, like, no 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 I, I guide you in the every detail. So you I, that's why I need you to have e views with you. So then I will do this okay and you do the same. We do this hand by hand. Okay, got it. Okay, so it's hand by hand. So the, uh, what I want from this class is, is to guide you into the fundamentals. Once you know this class, every class after that is going to be much simpler for you. Got it. Okay, cool. And then another question I do have is that um, you are still emailing me on my private email. No, Not yeah, I changed that. I changed that today. After you told me, I changed that. You you know you have received now the the invitation to Zoom. Ah, no, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Because I used the the chain. I will do yeah. that for next class. Yes, no, but I yeah. have you in my list already with uh, for the for the meeting. Yeah, that's um, that's really it. Um, thank you so much. Okay. I'll see you next see week. You, my pleasure. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Chu, do you have questions? <laughs>